All right, good morning, everybody. We have uh, three presenters to get through, so we're going to go ahead and get started. First up is Jim Bell, and why don't you see double? All right, so Adam Jorgensen's already been kind enough to postpone his talk for a few weeks, and I know Lloyd has some pretty neat stuff to talk about, so I'll try to be quick here. But hopefully some of you all got to see our patient this morning. She was kind enough to come in, so thank you. And um, as you can probably guess, our patient does not have diplopia. Um, so she's a 69-year-old right-handed woman who came in with the chief complaint of not being able to look left with her left eye. This was found incidentally at a routine visit with her primary care physician in April of this year. Um, the patient was referred to a general ophthalmologist who saw the patient a few months later. In the interim, she thought about it, and she really couldn't recall a time that she ever did see double. She also, um, after long thinking, decided that maybe the only thing she could come up with was she had to turn her head to the left to see oncoming traffic for the past few months, but that was about it. The general ophthalmologist saw her and determined that she had a left six nerve palsy and thought it was new, so the patient was referred to neuro-ophthalmology. She came to see us, and we got a little more past ocular history. At the age of four, she was noted to have crossed eyes. This was noticed after she fell down some stairs. She wasn't symptomatic from this, uh, so her parents decided to wait for strabismus surgery. She decided to wait when she was an adult, and she had it done at the age of 35. Uh, she never did have diplopia. She never patched an eye as a child. She had cataract surgery in each eye in 2008, and she recently developed a paracentral scotoma in her right eye that uh, has been followed by a retina specialist and was determined to be a macular hole or pseudo hole. So uh, some other medical history. She was born with a cleft lip. She's always had, as she puts it, low lung capacity, possibly kyphoscoliosis, and she's anemic. Uh, this morning, actually, I just learned that her father had crossed eyes, which was unknown to us before. So her family history might be a little contributory. Um, but social history medications don't really contribute to the story. So on examination, she was 2040 in the right eye, 2025 in the left eye. No anisocoria or APD. Visual fields were normal. Amsler grid was pretty much uh, agreeable with her story of her macular hole in the right eye, and her tell was essentially normal as well. Color vision was normal according to Ishihara color plates. She pretty much did not have uh, stereopsis. She could not see the fly on that exam. Uh, and only pertinent finding on anterior exam was that she had posterior chamber intraocular lenses. We didn't dilate her because she was being followed by a retina specialist, but all we saw on our undilated exam was fairly healthy looking optic nerves. So on to the, the meat of the story. Uh, she was found to have a comitant eight prism diopter right hypertrophia, along with the following in her right eye, minus three abduction, minus two adduction, minus one introduction, and normal superduction. The left eye showed minus four abduction, normal adduction, normal introduction, and minus one superduction. Uh, in addition to all of this, her right palpebral fissure narrowed with left gaze, and her left palpebral fissure narrowed with right gaze. So I was trying to take all this in. I was pretty excited. I thought, this patient has a left six. That means their left eye doesn't look left. I got this. But, but then I saw all this. <laughs> so here's her strabismus uh, series. Um, and I'll, I'll just focus on two photographs since we got a lot of talk today. Um, right here in right gaze, you can tell that her right eye is not abducting well. Her left eye, it looks like it's coming short a little bit. She actually has good adduction with her left eye. Um, and this palpebral fissure is narrowed on right gaze. And the, the left gaze photo, her right palpebral fissure is narrowed, limited adduction with the right eye, and limited abduction with the left eye. So here's a video in case you didn't get to see her upstairs. So here she's going to look to the left, and you can see the narrowing of that right palpebral fissure, which is pretty important, uh, narrowing of the left palpebral fissure on right gaze. And we'll run through it one more time here. So she was kind enough to bring in some old photographs of herself. And you can see here at a young age, uh, the camera's to her left, and she's having some difficulty abducting with her 
left eye. Again, the camera's to the left, still limited abduction with the left eye. And a similar situation here when she's a little older. Um, she's uh, more of an adult here, and the camera's to her right, and you can see limited abduction with the right eye in this photograph. So just really quickly, less than a week later, we had another patient come in, a 29-year-old woman, exact same complaint, couldn't look left with her left eye. She was admitted for HFB meningitis uh, in September, discharged a couple days later, and incidentally, on follow-up with an outside neurologist, it was found that she couldn't abduct with her left eye, so she was referred to us. Um, this patient had known of this since she was a little girl. She'd never had strabismus surgery, never worn a patch. She had daily uh, horizontal binocular dystopia that resolved within seconds, and it never bothered her, so she never really did anything about it. Um, her visual acuity was 20-20 in the right eye, 21-25 in the left eye. She refracted to 20-20 and 2025, but she had some very prominent anisometropia. Um, normal color vision and stereopsis with her was actually fairly normal. Her uh, extraocular movements were pretty much normal with her right eye, and she showed minus four abduction with the left eye, minus two adduction, normal supra and introduction, and narrowing of the left palpebral fissure on right gaze. So with all that information, does anyone have any idea what these patients have? Leah? So a little bit about Duane syndrome. Named after uh, Alexander Duane, he published his paper on this subject in 1905 in ophthalmology. The title of his paper was Congenital Deficiency of Abduction Associated with Impairment of Adduction, Retraction Movements, Contraction of the Palpebral Fissure, and Oblique Movements of the Eye. So you pretty much have the disease in the title of his paper, which is kind of convenient. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about it. In his paper, he actually credited multiple other authors who had previously worked on the subject. So he wasn't the original author to describe this, this problem, but he sort of grouped previous findings together for everyone else to have an easier understanding of it. In Europe, they actually call it stilling kirk Duane syndrome to spread the credit around a little more. It happens in about one out of a 1,000 people. Um, a very small number have been shown to be familial. Both autosomal dominant and recessive patterns have been seen. Uh, monozygotic twin cases have been concordant and discordant. Um, a few of the cases have been linked to a specific gene, BURS2 on chromosome 20. Uh, this has been associated with decreased hearing too, so that's kind of an abnormal variant. Um, if you have sporadic Duanes, it's more likely that you have other physical abnormalities. And as you recall, our first patient had a cleft lip at birth, so that she fit that description as well. It's kind of funny, a, a little bit later, I saw another patient with a type 1 Duane which I'll show pictures of her in a few minutes. But she said that she was originally diagnosed by Dr. Hoffman, who said, you know, you know what you have? You have Duane's, and he explained to her what it is, and she said, okay, and she thought they were done, and she told me, then he looked her in the eye and said, now what are you missing? And she said, what are you talking about? And he said, all you people are missing something. What are you missing? And she said, oh, I was born without a tooth. So um, a lot of these patients do have some other sort of an abnormality somewhere. <laughs> so um, there was a series of 835 patients with Duane syndrome who were looked at, and over half of them had only involvement of the left eye, interestingly. No one really knows why that's the case. Um, a few patients had only involvement of the right eye, and even less were bilateral, so our first patient's a little unusual in that regard. Over half the patients are women, and no race seems to be affected more than other races. Classically, the teaching is that this occurs because of a lack of abducens nucleus and sixth nerve. Uh, the lateral rectus develops anyway with innervation from an anomalous branch of the third cranial nerve. Um, the narrowing of the palpebral fissure occurs because that third nerve causes contraction of the lateral and medial rectus at the same time, um, and then the, the eyelids start to close. Diplopia is not common with these patients. Uh, they can acquire a favorite head position where they achieve binocular vision. Uh, so that might be why that second patient was able to have stereopsis uh, on her exam. 
So anisometropia is fairly common in these patients, which we saw with the second patient. Uh, and often <coughs> there's no esotropia in primary gaze, which is important because with a sixth nerve palsy, you would expect a large esotropia. That was another uh, sort of key finding in our patient. She did not have an esotropia. So that was sort of a, a red flag that maybe it wasn't a sixth. So in development of uh, most people, the cranial nerves and extraocular muscles develop in weeks four to eight of gestation. Muscles come first, then cranial nerve three, then cranial nerve six, and that'll become important in a minute. There are three types of Duanes, as um, Leah was alluding to in our BCS series to give a little bit of help. You can remember the type by the number of Bs in the description. So type one is just limited abduction. Type two is limited adduction. Type three is limited abduction with adduction. And all types have limited or narrowing of the palpebral fissure with adduction. So here's just a quick uh, series of a patient who came in with the type one Duanes. In the interest of time, just focus on this photograph here. You can see limited abduction with that left eye, but it adducts quite well, but you see the narrowing of the palpebral fissure on right gaze. And here's, sorry, a quick video of that. So there's that narrowing of the palpebral fissure, and then she does not have abduction with that eye. She actually had normal down gaze, I think she just had a little continuous gaze. So narrowing of the palpebral fissure again, and then limited abduction again. So a couple of studies that kind of changed the way this may be thought about. In 2005, there was a series of patients with Duane syndrome who were looked at with MRI. Um, and they had a control series of 60 patients who did not have Duane syndrome. The purpose of this was to see if they could see a sixth nerve using this modality. And on all 60 of the patients, they were able to see the sixth cranial nerve. So it was obviously a good test to go looking for a sixth nerve. Not a single one of the patients with type one Duane's that they looked at had a sixth nerve. Both of the patients they looked at with type two, which is the most rare form of Duane's, had a, a sixth nerve and two out of the five uh, patients with a type three had a sixth nerve. So the importance here isn't, I, d I think, as much the patients who didn't have a sixth nerve because that was already thought, it's that some of these patients actually do have a sixth nerve. Um, so that became pretty important information. Other, another similar study a few years later looked at abducens nerve abnormalities, which included the absence of a sixth nerve. Uh, and every patient with type one and type three um, had some sort of an abnormality of the sixth nerve but only some of them with type two had an abnormality that could be seen on MRI. So at least a couple of these patients with type two Duane's, as far as people could tell with imaging, had a perfectly normal looking sixth nerve. So what does all that mean since initially we thought that this happened because of an absence of a sixth nerve? Well, another way to look at it is more of a continuum than three completely distinct and separate types. Um, and I think it's easiest to start with a type three. So in a type three, you have a certain number of fibers that are meant to go to that medial rectus. This is sort of a, a, new, a new way of looking at it, a new theory. I don't think there have been any studies to completely confirm this, but you have a certain number of fibers that should be devoted to that medial rectus from the third nerve. And if you divert eno enough of them to the lateral rectus, you're gonna end up with more limited adduction. At the same time, that lateral rectus is gonna contract in a more strong fashion because it's got more fibers going to it which is going to even more contradict the adduction action of that medial rectus, um, leading to limited adduction. And at the same time, these patients either have an abnormal or a completely absent sixth nerve, so they're gonna have limited abduction. And that's how you end up with a type three. If you take some of those diverted fibers and give them back to the medial rectus, you end up with stronger adduction, um, probably to the point that you don't really notice it on exam. So then now the patients are able to adduct just fine, but they still have that abnormal six that they can't abduct. So that would be a type one. If you take a patient more like the type three and divert most of their fibers that should have gone to the medial rectus and send them to the lateral rectus, again, you end up with limited adduction. But if they have a normal six nerve, they're gonna have normal abduction, which leads you to a type two with just limited adduction and normal abduction. So the interesting thing there is that the common link doesn't seem to be the sixth nerve, it seems to be the third cranial nerve, which is a little different than the classical way of looking at this disease. Um, and it's kind of hard to do 
large studies looking at this because a type two Duane's is sort of important in that regard and it's quite rare uh, to be seen in clinics. So anyway, I thought that was very interesting and I apologize, um, my brain feels like Spaghetti Junction in Louisville, which is why I have that photograph up there. Um, in the end, even though some things have changed, one thing hasn't and that's the treatment suggestions for these patients. In 1905, Dr. Duane said, in general, an operation is not required and is to be avoided if possible, and for the most part, that still holds true today. Um, strabismus surgeries don't improve motility, they just improve the direction of gaze, and uh, today that's, that's still, for the most part, the case. Strabismus surgery does have a part for these patients. If their gaze where they achieve binocular vision is really abnormal, like if they walk around with their head to the side, that can be really uncomfortable and um, can look abnormal too. It can make them self-conscious of the way they're walking around. So at times, strabismus surgery can be helpful to help them achieve stereopsis in a more normal gaze. Uh, and the patient that I mentioned with type one Duane, she actually had to have neck surgery because she was walking around like this all day for years. So that can be helpful. It's just important to explain to them that if you go with that route, uh, it's not going to improve their motility. It just might help them hold their head in a more normal position. So I'd like to give thanks to our photographers who stayed late on a couple days to help me out with these patients. And of course, to our patient who came in, um, that was very helpful, so thank you very much. And uh, I'll take any questions now. Yes. Oh, with the Duanes? So that wasn't really mentioned in the new theory that I was reading about, and that's, that's interesting that you bring that up. So I think that's still sort of in the dark, as far as I could tell. I don't know if anyone else has read something different, but um, like I said, there's not, there's not a huge amount of new information just because of how rare the type two is, and that's pretty important because those patients are so different from the other two types. So I don't have a great answer to that. It was really neat to see the old photographs by our patient. And she, was, she was very prompt with them. We saw her in the morning and we had the pictures by noon. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> Thank you.